So we're back with Maxim Jago. Maxim, Cam. Hello again. It's fantastic to see you in another continent. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so close together. Uh, yes. Time-wise, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, I thought we'd start. Uh, for those who maybe haven't seen the first interview right. at any yes. of the show that we did yeah. together, yeah. talk a little bit about you know who this fascinating Maxim Jago <laughs> is. What do you what you do? You know, I have to pay people money every time they say that. You know, you have to pay them money. Okay, <laughs> here's my five dollars. <laughs> uh, I so what I usually say is that I I share my time between directing films and speaking as a futurist and working as a, a media technology specialist. So I think in the media technology world, I'm best known because I write the official book on Premiere Pro, the Class Winner book, which is used by most film schools. I also record the official video training for it. And so, uh, as, I, as I think I joked last time, very often when I go to conferences, I get these strange looks from people. <laughs> they recognize do, you. you know, did you steal something from me? Do I, do I like you or not? <laughs> and then I'll say, something like, now let's click on the file menu, and suddenly they remember they spent a month with me in their heads learning Yeah, to learning edit. how to use Premiere, yeah. So I, I teach a lot of different um, video editing applications, but more now I do consultancy and workflow and travel around the world um, helping organizations with that sort of technology. But in particular, uh, in recent years, I've been speaking more about the human condition and uh, forecasting new technologies. So. Uh, I forget the quote uh, exactly, but they say it's not about seeing where the puck is on the, the ice hockey game, it's about where the puck's going to be. So I speak very often about the way technology is going, is impacting and will, will continue to impact the human condition. I'm particularly interested in communication, uh, I'm interested in the, the metaphysical journey and uh, I think that we should, as a species, we should have uh, existential joy, not existential angst. We just dive in. I was, I was going to say earlier, I read a beautiful quote. They were saying that the secret to life is not to arrive serenely at the grave in control. You should stumble and tumble and dash and slide across the ground into the grave, covered in cuts and bruises, saying, that was an amazing ride. That's how you should live life. So... Um, yeah, broadly speaking, I, I write books on technology and uh, forecast emerging technologies. And increasingly, I'm, I'm working as a consultant with uh, some larger organizations uh, as a futurist, talking about where we're going and the, and the technologies we need to focus on. And um, I'm very interested in the very big, the, the grand, you know, new ideas for technology, and the, the very small, which for me is when a technology becomes uh, insignificant. A good example is I remember years ago when uh, we had the very first color newspaper cover and everybody was going wild about it and you could see it was inevitable that we would have it. But for me, the most exciting moment was when it was no longer remarkable that everybody took all it newspapers yeah. were in color. And uh, another example is online, uh, online video. I'm a chief innovation officer for a, a film distribution company called FilmDo, filmdo.com, double O. We have about 600 feature films we distribute worldwide. And I, a big turning point for me was a, a blogger, reporter, was talking about how he transitioned from watching video on a laptop to watching it on a big screen TV. And he was disappointed that because of the distance of view, actually the image size was just marginally smaller because the laptop was so much closer. Right. The important thing for me about that article was that he found it unremarkable that he was watching video on a laptop. And that was, when it becomes unremarkable, you realize, okay, everyone's cool with this now and, and we're all okay with it. And we're now seeing uh, new viewing habits, for example, where most younger people don't really care where they access their media. It doesn't matter if it's on a, a mobile device or a tablet or a laptop or, or a video projector. And I think that's very interesting because it's, it means that the relationship we have with the language of the visual media itself, that language is changing. And we need to keep up with that. It's interesting you say that because the same thing happened in audio. Do you remember yes. when we were both a little bit younger, yeah. there were so many people, ago, yeah. a few years ago, five <laughs> years ago, when we were like just out of college. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there were people that were really into audio, so they'd have these amazing home audio systems mm -hmm. or in a studio. You've mm -hmm. been in studio environments, I've been in lots of studios. Yeah. And 
you know, you're listening to every sound, the placement exactly. Yeah. And now you have a whole generation of people that have never even heard audio the way it was meant to be heard. They're used to hearing it That's through right. inexpensive earbuds, for yeah. example, or even expensive earbuds. It's not mm -hmm. the same thing as no. what you hear in a studio. And they don't care. Yeah, and they're they listening don't care. to MP3s, it's changed, right? Yeah. Which use uh, you, you probably Huge heard compression. Of psychoacoustics, yeah. right? Yeah. So you, when you hear two sounds that are similar and one is quieter than the other one, your brain precognitively filters out the quieter one. And I'm very interested in consciousness. I'm very interested in our relationship with reality, and in particular in terms of storytelling. So, you know, right now, uh, I'm at the festival raising uh, raising finance for uh, my first feature film, Jolly's Garden. Just congratulations Thank about you. getting to this point yeah, with that. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, it's Jolly. Well, it's it's uh, Jolly's Garden. It's, it's actually Jolly's Garden. It's the French spelling. Jolly. Jolly's Garden. Uh, you know, we're shooting 2D, which is great, fine. We're doing 4K RAW. It's a great quality. We've got a great director of photography. We're also shooting for media. But you're not shooting media. yet, are you? We're shooting in July. You are going to be shooting in July. Yeah, we're still in raising July. funds too. Well, yeah, but it's it's a very quick. We're ready to shoot. So you're we're ready just to at the shoot. last okay. stage, and we're you know we're saying to the investors, come on, if you're going <laughs> to, there's a lot of people in in actually, if you're raising capital for a business. Uh, I work with some companies that are raising very large amounts of capital for uh, amazing technologies. And you sit in on these meetings with uh, potential investors and you can tell from their body language that they're just talking about it. And there's other people that come in the room and they say, yep, okay, give me two weeks and I'm, we're going to do this. So I've gotten to the point now where I'm just saying, yep. can you get the money yeah. into our business account by the end of May? If so, great. If not, let's talk about other projects. But what's, what's fascinating for me about uh, Jolly's Garden as a project is that we're approaching it in three different ways, and it's the same narrative. So we've got uh, 2D filming, it's going to look beautiful, we're shooting 4K RAW, it's going to look great. Then we're going to shoot 360 media for VR headsets. And of course, as we saw with NAB and everywhere now, people are talking about VR. The reason I think people are talking about it uh, so much, it's not just you know the coming of HD or you know, uh, 4K, and it's, it's not just that the medium is getting better. I think it's the first genuinely new medium since color. Because you're faking proprial perception. You get the feeling that you're present. And then first generation headsets are acceptable. Third, third generation is going to be amazing. But what's beautiful is I was talking to some guys about this last night. We've got more and more people coming on board to help us with the VR aspect of the film. We're shooting very high quality 360 media, much higher quality than the headsets can show. A quick question on this. Um, I've seen some cameras that are using like 8K sensors. Right. And then they use lens technology yeah. to then give them a 360 a full view. 360. So yeah. how are you guys doing it or planning on doing it? Well, or can you reveal that? At the moment, we're looking at three approaches to shooting the VR, or the 360 media. And yeah. just for clarity for people who aren't up on, on the VR and 360, basically 360 means you can turn your head in any direction because you're filming a sphere of video information. Right. It's basically getting everything that's around you, above you to a certain degree, a certain and, degree. and below you to a certain degree, depending right. on the way somebody is achieving and then, that. And yeah. the audio is placed spatially, and as you turn yeah. your head, you see different angles. Yeah. And, I, and I prefer that to be 360 video also as opposed to VR because right. for me, VR VR is a space more you can move through. Exactly, versus, yeah. yeah. So you can navigate the environment. And of course, okay. the VR works fantastically if it's computer generated, then you can do true stereoscopic media with perfect, perfect calibration, no headaches, exactly. and you can explore the environment. But we're not quite really at the stage where we have photorealistic VR environments. And I'm a storyteller, I want it to look realistic. And we were talking earlier about uh, The Jungle Book, which is a mind-blowingly great film and it's like a lucid dream where if animals could speak that's exactly what they would look like but we're, we're looking at three options option number one is that we have our director of photography on a moving platform following the acts the action with a 360 camera and there's several options available and we're quite interested in the the kodak pro camera system it shoots 4k in two directions you get an 8k source with one stitching line and we've heard good re reports about the pictures the second option is that the uh, the story is about a uh, a young lady called Jolly who lives in an underground garden. She's lived there her entire life and she doesn't know the garden's artificial or that she's blind. No one's ever told her that people can see. And it's a psychological thriller about why she's a prisoner in this garden. It's a beautiful project. But because the garden's artificial, we can embed cameras in several areas of the garden. 
And then we can just run the story as theatre. And we just block the action near the cameras. And that's great because it uh, means that the cameras can be in the shot for the 2D filming, but of course we can't use the, 3D, the 360 content because we're in the room filming. Mm-hmm. But it just means we don't have to do anything to the set. And it's a genuine re- reversioning of the story. But we're also looking at uh, Microsoft have a HoloLens technology, which is very interesting, which shoots from the outside in with multiple cameras, and it uses the variation in the optical feeds to identify 3D objects dynamically and generate a 3D model of the events, including your performance and its video quality. So what's interesting for me about that, we're talking to Microsoft about working on this project together. What's interesting for me about that is that you get a true VR experience where you can explore the garden. You can ignore the dialogue. If they're talking over there, you can go and look at the flowers. Or you can go over close to it. Or you can shrink the entire model down to a tabletop and watch it as little figures in front of you. So I think it's a very interesting technology, and we're just looking at whether it's a suitable project uh, to work on with that. But of course, you know, uh, NVIDIA are doing a lot of great work uh, with uh, multi-threaded processing to allow this very, very fast capture of an enormous amount of data. And we're looking at, you know, if you look at the work HP are doing with really pushing the boundaries with the, these powerful machines, you know, a lot of people talk about the Z840 desktops. Everywhere I go in the world, I visit a lot of TV stations, when they finish their analysis and they look at all of the options on the market for computers, they very often just they end up with Z840s. They get, because it is just an amazing machine. Well, well, that's what we're using. The yeah. It's yeah. a great system. So you need that power. If you're doing ray traced, uh, true 3D rendering with virtual cameras, you need a lot of processing power. And so we're looking at, we're working with a lot of partners. We've got a lot of companies uh, in the industry working with us, and we're just yeah. throwing everything at it. Yeah, but for your experience, you're going to create the VR experience. Yeah. Is that something that you want to be able to drive in installations using very powerful workstations, or is that something I you want to have the consumers a, to yeah, be able to do at home, or is it a combination of those? No, I mean, you know, a lot of people are talking about uh, VR experiences in, in cinemas. You go to a theater for a VR experience. That's a little tricky, but... I think the only reason to do that is if you're going somewhere that they have mechanical chairs which will move your body as you're having the experience. Like a motion ride used to be, yeah. A motion ride. We're already seeing some Kickstarter uh, home versions of that. I'm fully there for gaming. I think it's going to be amazing. But I'm looking at this as a consumer-grade thing. We're looking at a, there's a number of VR headsets that are coming to market this year. Uh, you know, I'm interested to see Sony's uh, what was called the Morpheus Project, because Sony have a strong history of developing consumer technology, just like HP do. And it's interesting to see what everybody's doing for a version one. Uh, but we do have a problem that the, the screens in these headsets aren't really high enough pixel density at the moment, and the, the peripheral vision isn't really wide enough. I'm forecasting the third version will fix both of those. The second version will fix one, but I'm one not sure which will be yeah. fixed first. Uh, but I, what we're looking at is this incredible journey towards um, fake experiences, if you like. But, you know, as I think I mentioned before, the part of your brain that has experiences doesn't differentiate between something that you imagine, uh, remember, um, are, are shown, you witness, or dream. It's the same thing for that part of you that has experiences. As the Zen philosophers say, it's the observer, observing the thinker that has the experience. But um, I think that... So I don't think that the, the image quality is that important. But for narrative, for drama, it's critical that the protagonist is someone we can empathize with. Because if we don't engage with them emotionally, we don't share their journey. But if we do engage with them emotionally, if we feel connected to them intellectually and emotionally, we literally experience their journey. We don't observe it, we literally experience it ourselves. So with Jolly's Garden, we're going to do 2D, we're doing 360, then we're going to put the cameras away, and we're going to invite live audiences into the garden with the cast to experience the story live, just because it's cool. So so, you'll do that on set? Absolutely, uh, just because why not? Okay. And and we're just interested in looking at the different ways that the same narrative can be explored in these different approaches. So you're not planning on meeting up with Lloyd Webber and... (laughs) <laughs> some musical based on... Yeah, I'm just not crazy yeah. about musical theatre. My <laughs> girlfriend loves it, and so, you know, when we're having a conversation, she'll break out into song, and I have to say, life is not a musical. <laughs> I'm trying to work out when we're going for dinner. But, uh, 
But I'm, yeah, I'm very interested in, in this journey that we're taking. You know, there's the transhumanism movement, augmenting uh, humanity uh, biologically. And of course, they would say that we're already transhuman because we wear glasses, we have hearing aids, we have fillings in our teeth. Ray Kurzweil um, is, is talking about uh, this merging of consciousness. We have a huge problem with that because we, don't, we still don't know what consciousness is. And uh, there's some very interesting theories emerging from, uh, from, from quantum physics where they're suggesting that actually consciousness might be an emergent property of entanglement. And if it is, we have a problem because we can't measure other dimensions yet. So we, we kind of have, have to wing it with what consciousness is, which means how do we merge with it, we don't know. But we know that within about two weeks, the brain adapts to connecting with uh, technology. Uh, they've done experiments with remote robotic arms, where within a couple of weeks, the brain just accepts that the arm is part of you. And I've studied Tai Chi Chuan for many years and, and, and teach it as a martial art. And one of the things they say when you're using a weapon is the weapon should not feel like something you're holding. It should feel like An a part of your body. Of you. yeah. And it turns out that our brains are so plastic that they will adapt within a couple of weeks to feeling like an object is part of you. Well, aren't there some scientists that have claimed that they can transfer people's consciousness now? I, I've heard that they're no, claiming that was this. No, the that was terrible press. What they did, I, I think oh, I know the story okay. you're talking about. What they did is they, they captured information from the brain waves directly, which we can do in a very, to a very small degree. They recorded that information, emailed it to a friend, and then took that information and projecting it, projected it with uh, electromagnetic interference into the brain of, a, of another person in a way that was just enough for them to get some basic information. So that's a lot different than what I've well, they just heard emailed, about. They yeah, emailed yeah, yeah. an attachment. <laughs> right, that's right, not right. really projecting consciousness. But right. interestingly, I'm working on a documentary at the moment as well. I've got about four projects in the running. It's uh, <laughs> always right. Uh, if anybody, this is an amazing project. I mentioned before we started recording, if anybody's ever, ever read uh, Illusions by the American author Richard Bach, a life-changing book, and I'm, uh, we're in discussions for me to direct the, uh, the film adaptation. And uh, it's very interesting. The people who are interested in work on this project, it's a beautiful book. I'm working on a lot of projects. One of them is a documentary about telepathy. And we've, we have a Park Avenue psychiatrist leading the project. And uh, it's called An Open Mind. We have 50 hours of interviews, 60 hours of interviews now with physicists, psychologists, psychics, you name it, mystics. There's a, there's a study conducted where they, they got uh, people who feel closely connected. Uh, relatives, uh, twins, lovers, whatever. You put one person in a dark room, you put another person in a room in a condition where they're in a, a Faraday cage, so there's no electromagnetic transference, they're wearing fuzzy gloves, uh, their eyes are covered over, they've got white noise in their ears, there's no sensory information at all, and nobody's in the room with them. And their brains are wired up. You randomly shine bright lights in the face of the first person. It's not a very nice experiment for them. Yeah. So they get the bright light the visual cortex of the second person Lights responds. Up. That's amazing. And there's no connection between yeah. them. And there's a lot of experiments like this. Nobody knows how it works, but it's widely accepted by the scientific community that it does. And one of the theories, which I think is beautiful and compelling, Tesla alluded to. And the theory is that we're not individual consciousnesses. We're individuated consciousness, that there is only one, and we're all part of it. And if you look at all mystic systems throughout history, they've all said basically the same thing. And I think that, you know, they say that reality is always more beautiful than our imagining of it. So what if that were true? What if we could use the incredible science that we have available, the incredible scientific method, to uncover the mechanism of that? And we, instead of saying it's just mystic and it's foo-foo and we don't yeah. know what it is, well, no, it's not, because we know that we can measure this, and there's lots of experiments yeah. like well, it. Well, if that were true, then what's the point of fighting with each other, right? You're fighting with yourself. Right. And there's, yeah. a, there's a, a guy who wrote, writes a I blog. I like the end game. Well, <laughs> you know that. See, you yeah. and I are on the same page, yeah. right? It's yeah. the big and the small. Where's the, yeah. What is the end game? The end game is that we realize there is only one human race. So we are a family on this tiny, beautiful marble floating through the vastness of space. We really need to take care of each other. Was a, a teenager did a beautiful blog uh, video post where he was saying, again, it's the end game. We're either alone in the universe or we're not. So let's look at the consequences of that uncertainty. If we are alone in the universe, oh my goodness, we really need to start taking care of each other. If we're unique in the vastness of what it appears to be possibly an infinite realm of space and time, 
and we're the only sentient beings. We really need to sort this stuff out. Let's get rid of the nuclear weapons, take care of the only environment we have that sustains us, and start to love one another and stop fearing one another. That's one outcome. Let's say we're not alone in the universe and there are intelligent alien races around. We really need to start taking care of one another because we now represent a planet and they, uh, they are going to look to us as a species, not as individual nations. The outcome is exactly the same. So let's just flip a coin and decide which it is which it and presume it's one or the other. And that's what Schrodinger's cat teaches us. You know, the, the Schrodinger's cat, you put a cat in a box with a poison gas and it's a, a random event that the gas will be released or never released effectively. It's, it's a very long half-life from a nuclear um, a radioactive uh, substance. You put the cat in the box, you don't know if the cat is alive or dead. So the question is, is it alive or dead? And you can never find out. It's a completely sealed container. And so the uh, kind of quantum physicists would say, well, it's alive and dead, or it's neither alive nor dead. And I would say, reboot the computer. If you're trying to, if you're trying to fix a problem with your computer, chances are rebooting is going to fix it. And I think what Schrodinger's cat, I used to do technical support for Microsoft, and it took, I, I, I worked out how to explain Schrodinger's cat in the time it took to reboot. And at the end I would say, what Schrodinger's cat teaches us is that there are some things we cannot know. So we might as well act on the basis of the outcome that suits us best. Which for me in the case of the cat is that the cat is happy and alive and well and chilling. I don't want to know that the cat's dead, so let's just presume the cat is alive and it's fine. And in the case of computer technology, reboot, it's probably going yeah. to... It's or the easiest solution. It's probably going to fix it. Or open the box and take the poor cat out and well, don't, don't but, put it and in again, there in the first but then place. It's yeah. This is the yeah. thing about decision-making. Yeah. Don't put the cat in the box in, in the, the first place. place. Yeah. So uh, I, you know, what this quantum uncertainty principle teaches us is something about life, that you might as well just act on the basis of the outcome you want. If you're trying to find somewhere to park, go straight to where you're going to go and hope that there's a space, because there might be. Or as uh, uh, Jim Carrey was saying a little while ago, you can fail at what you hate to do, you might as well fail at what you love to do. There you so, go. So, you know, go for the simplest possible explanation. But as that, you know, that teenager was saying, we might as well pick one, because the end game is that we will end up taking care of each other. Let's just hurry that up. And again, you know, in terms of storytelling, I think that we... I think that we overcomplicate uh, the way to convey narrative information. Uh, we recently decoded the transmission protocol between the human retina and the visual cortex, which means we no longer need to build fake retinas anymore. We can just transmit the information directly. So we're overcoming this barrier between the, the perception of experience for the brain and constructed media. But putting all that aside, what you know, what are we experiencing as a consciousness? You know, I have a, a theory of consciousness I call the gatekeeper theory of consciousness, which is where, and a lot of, there's a lot of evidence of this, that all the thinking actually occurs non-consciously, precognitively, and there's a gatekeeper in the brain that selectively feeds information into the consciousness for us to experience, and there's an evolutionary benefit for that, but also in terms of, uh, let's say, spiritual, if you want to use that word, or, or intellectual growth, we need a limited subset of information to work on. But if you look at experience, I don't think as a species we get space or time at all. I don't think we actually understand them. What we have is a linearity to our experience that is repeated. I'm here with you now. I'm still here with you now. <laughs> yes, I'm yeah. still here with you now. But if you look at dream, dream is the experience of reality that consciousness has unfettered by physics. Most of your brain is in use most of the time. And it turns out that one scientist, I forget the story, but one scientist saw what appeared to be noise and figured it was noise, which just goes to show how stupid intelligent people can be. <laughs> so. so they eventually ran some studies into the noise, and it turns out that what was happening was they were, they were measuring brain function by getting the, the subject to do things consciously. And having gotten to do things consciously, they looked at the outcome. What they do really is look at um, blood flow in, in the brain, electrical, act electrical activity in the brain. So they were just measuring the conscious activity. Not the and, unconscious. Right. And consciousness is tiny. It's not the peak of the iceberg over the waterline. It's the snow well, on the peak of the iceberg. Exactly. It's like you said before with sound. Your brain will filter out the more quiet sound. Right. But our... 
ears and hearing capabilities are taking in every sound everything. around us, Absolutely. every single one. Right. And the brain has to just filter out and let you know what's important yeah. to you so you don't get hit by a car and, or whatever. And exactly. And we street. know that as storytellers, so we can control that. That's why you can be in a party having a conversation that's very interesting about life of the universe and everything and, and whether to have another coffee. And then somebody says your name and Boop. suddenly you, you yeah. hear just your name with perfect clarity. The reality is your brain was hearing every conversation in the room. Our, our ability to, uh, to interpret sound is absolutely amazing. It's really impressive. Uh, our, our vision, there are animal species with better vision than us, but our ears are incredible. Your brain's picking up all of it and selectively feeding just the, the part that's interesting to the, to the consciousness. And in fact, there's some interesting people now working on um, wireless earbuds that do that for you in a noisy place. So when you're having a conversation with somebody, it identifies the conversation that the, the headphones think that you probably want to hear and uses noise cancelling to filter out lots of other noise in the room just so you can talk to each other more clearly. Very interesting. But all of that's happening anyway, precognitively. That's the other 90% of what your brain is doing. Did you know your, your brain makes decisions non-consciously and then a fraction of a second later, your conscious mind has the experience of making the decision? Now, as story, so as a teacher, I wrote a book about teaching and learning a few years ago. It's a, a teaching masterclass called the ESP Teaching System. It's based on empathy skills, storytelling, and patterns. And what I, what I teach, I teach a lot of teachers to teach. I certify them for Adobe and um, I'm a master trainer for Adobe. And what I teach is to teach the non-conscious mind of your students, not the conscious mind. In fact, very often what you need to do is distract the conscious mind. Look at the puppet, look at the funny story while you give the positive affirmative single clause statements to the non-conscious mind because the non-conscious mind doesn't do negatives. It doesn't do them at all. So if I I've say, that before, don't, yeah, eat, yeah. don't think of an apple, you have to think of an apple in order to not, not think, think of about it. Right, right. So why, why make the brain use up all those CPU cycles? Why not just say, think of a tree? <laughs> and then you're not making your students, you're not making your listener do too much work. So, and I think, again, I think as storytellers, I'm very interested in gaming. I'm working on a project called Orpheus Rising, which is a love story thriller where we're, we're shooting the, the film. We're going to acquire all of the locations for the game sequel that will release the same day as the film. And the idea is you go to the cinema, you see the film, you go home and you cross the fourth wall into the environment you just saw on the big screen. And you then have an interactive experience. There are some incredible games now that are really, I would argue, filmic experiences that you are engaged in. And I think we're moving towards this, this, we're getting towards what's going to begin to feel like lucid dreaming. We're starting to see, there's already a couple of years ago now, a cradle cap that has a rudimentary reading of your uh, brain waves that actually, it's a key logger. So, you know, you can actually capture a click using your brain waves. They use them for people in, who are you know, um, fully immobile physically, but they have brainwave activity, so they can control wheelchairs now just using brain waves. They can navigate and maneuver. We're looking at that technology becoming consumer technology, so your interaction with computers is completely intuitive, completely natural. And of course, the technology has to make that feel natural. But in terms of gaming, we're, I'm saying five years. We're five years away from the most amazing VR headsets, where I'm, I would estimate that at version three, they'll begin to integrate, in some cases, uh, brainwave reading, so that as you're exploring the environment, it's responding to your brain, not your controller. The scary part is if they can go backwards and engineer things into your brain that you they don't can. want there in the first place. They're, they're already with doing With these it. kinds of devices, you know? Yeah, it's yeah. frightening. So <clears throat> I'm estimating, um, it's difficult to say because it depends how much greed is in the picture, how much people hold technology back. Right. But I would say within 10 years, they'll have the technology to project electromagnetically into areas of the brain, and in particular to things like the visual cortex and the, and the, the auditory cortex, so that you are projecting experience into the brain. But I think that we'll probably look at 20 to 25 years before you can just slip something over the back of your ear, which tunes into your particular brain and starts projecting uh, visual and auditory information. So it's it, going to be scary to walk into a store, Maxim, because the second you walk through, yes. it's going to project these visions of what you're going to look like wearing we're, this particular outfit. And, you right, know. but we're moving towards yeah. a new understanding of what it means to be a human being. Because until recently, thanks to the industrial age, we've seen our 
our species in terms of work. It's a meritocratic society. You work hard, you're defined by your job. We're moving towards what will be um, universal basic income, everyone's living for free, and we're now looking at the human being in terms of experience, in terms of our perception of reality. And it's a, new, it's a revisioning of what does it mean to be human, and the storytellers are at the forefront of that. Because we're the ones, you know, to my mind, there are two people working in media. There are people who just want to make a living and make money and have a job, and that's great. They're the craftspeople of the industry. And then you've got the bards of the modern age, who historically would have had a loot in and in to accompany the story with an emotion. Now we've got a full sensory experience. But ultimately, what we're doing is telling stories. And stories are so crucial to us as a species, it's hardwired into our genes. In fact, we learn via storytelling so naturally, we don't even realize we're doing it. Oh, yeah, sure. That's all they had in the old days, right? Stories. It's all we had. And so we're now using technology as our color palette. Yes, yeah, so let me ask you a question about that. We were just talking with Todd Bryant, who worked on Giant. So he did all the um, technical side of things. Yeah. And our, do, you know, do you know Todd? Have you met him? Yet? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay, no. really, really nice guy. But yeah. the interesting thing was, he said, okay, so. We got these Z840 workstations with mm. NVIDIA Quadro M6000s. Beautiful. And we were able to relook at our entire project yeah. because now we could do so much more to tell the story. Right. So with all your background for all these years, you know, writing the book on Premiere, the master classes, working with Adobe, I mean, just yeah. all these things you've done. Um, what do you see where we are today, mm. let's say, and take as an example, Z840s mm -hmm. with NVIDIA, what's coming mm. up with NVIDIA and VR. It's just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, so if you could like, very specifically drill down to, from the storyteller's perspective, mm. what this new hardware you know, on NVIDIA side is going to help with, but where are right. we today with something as high-end high as Z840 right. with the Quadro M6000? Uh -huh. You mean where it's, where it's headed as well, a technology? Well, well, where we are today, I mean, from a storyteller's perspective. Oh, I mean, absolutely. And content creation yeah. side of it, as it's well as doing yeah. something like what Giant is doing, using yeah. those to have their experience Well, it's with. about immediacy, isn't it? Um, you know, we're talking to NVIDIA about their VR technology as well and, and using it um, and working with them on Jolly's Garden. That's why I thought it's a perfect yeah, question to... You get know, your thoughts on. There's a, there's a motion graphics uh, guy I know called Bun Lee. And I was working at the Cannes Film Festival a few years ago as a mentor uh, uh, on a program for students who came here to shoot films, and, and uh, we, we were working with HP as well. And it, uh, we had a student that was saying, I'm not sure if we can do this. You know, I've got this idea, and I don't know if it can be done. And Bun Lee said, if we can imagine it, we can do it. It may not be easy, we but can we can definitely it do it. We can definitely do it. And, and that's our job as, as craftspeople working in this industry. What companies like HP and NVIDIA are doing is they're shortening the time between imagining it and doing it. And it's absolutely critical. I'm a primate. I'm a pattern-finding primate. I, uh, if I get hold of something, I want to be able to pick it up immediately and put it down and see it put down. What I don't want to do is move to pick something up, and a moment later, it comes over here. I don't want that lag. I don't want that delay. And that, that applies especially during the creative process. We're trying to take something that's in our visual imagination and turn it into something, really, that is tangible. I know it's just ones and zeros on a storage drive, but it is nonetheless tangible. You know, by the way, they found that information does weigh more. They found it does. <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> we... It's very interesting. We, uh, what we're finding now is that we can explore ideas, we can experiment, much faster, much more easily, with many fewer, many fewer barriers, because the technology is doing the work for us. And also, uh, it's, it's giving us a wider color palette. You know, I was talking to um, a friend of mine, Jeremy Young, he runs Atomos, and they, uh, they've developed uh, an, a high dynamic range location monitor. And he said, for the first time ever, when you're looking at the image on the screen, you can literally look past the screen to the set or the location, whatever it is, and, as lo and you can match them to your, by eye. It's not that you're, you have to adjust and think, well, it's a little bit darker, you know, the colors aren't quite there. You can literally look at the it's, reality. It's the reality. And if it matches the reality in front of you, you're fine. So we're pushing, pushing, pushing these boundaries so that you're freer and freer to work, and I, it's a cheesy line, but I always say the trick is that when you're talking about workflow, you should really be talking about flow. 
The technology should be doing the work so that as a creative, as a, as a prime mover, as a causal agent, as a creator of change, which is what all creativity is, you can just go for it. What we want is lucid dreaming, right? We want to be in a situation where we're thinking, well, hang on a second, what would happen if uh, the character, as they, as they wave their hand and point, there's some particle effects around their hand? You know, I was watching uh, Peter Pan, the film recently, and some of the visual effects in there. What if I wanted to say, watch this, and as I say, watch this, there's just some little, um, some little sparkle Sparkles. in the shot, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And historically, if I wanted that sparkle it's to have post. a little bit of glow, <laughs> yeah. oh my goodness. But now, even on set, we can say, hang on a minute, let's just throw in that particle effect and just show me what that looks like roughly immediately. And we can. This is what companies like HP and NVIDIA are allowing us to do. And what's important is that we do it in a way that the creative doesn't have to understand the technology. A lot of my work is about taking complex technologies and making them apprehensible for creative minds who don't want to think about the tech. They just want to do something. They just want to tell a story. Yeah, right, you know? right. And I, I have two brains. You know, when I'm working as a technologist, I love the fact that you know, Intel have got this new 3D NAND technology that's supposed to be up to, a, I think it's a thousand times faster it's than going to traditional be very NAND. interesting. Right well, around the corner. It's yeah. a, they're building it now. Yeah. So it's, when I'm working with 6K RAW, I think you know, we spoke before about this. I think we're going to top out at 8K RAW. And there's no point distributing more than 8K because it's effectively retina on the biggest screen consumers will ever look at at, the, at an average viewing distance. So it's just literally, it's a biological limit to our technology, which isn't that interesting that we're reaching that point oh. where... Well, unless consumers you do that cannot. now all around somebody. Well, absolutely. Yeah. But then I suppose we go for 24. Are multiple layers 24 because yeah. you're willing now depth information. step into it. Yeah, yeah. And we're doing for, well, ultimately, I think what we'll have is a true 3D model. As a company in Japan created uh, a genuine hologram by using, I think it was infrared lasers, to bounce particles of phosphorus in the air that glow because they're powered by the lasers, and you can look at it in 3D space and poke it with your finger. So we will have Star Wars-style holograms eventually. And I was saying for a long time, we don't have the technology to do that for a complex image, but we're doing it now for small. There's a little picture of a fairy, it's very beautiful. Uh -huh. To go back to your question, we're moving towards a time where the creatives can say, I just want to, for almost anything, and it'll happen. And so we are conveying, you know, our role ultimately is to convey understanding from one brain, brain to another. Not just knowledge, not just what time is it, but how do I feel? What is my perception? What is my perspective on this thing? And we're getting faster and faster and faster at sending it from one person's brain to another. And we're doing it non-geographically. I'm working at the moment on a project where we've got somebody working in Boston. I'm in London, uh, back and forth between London and Los Angeles. And we've got somebody in, you know, we're, we're in uh, Iceland and uh, somebody in, so we've got Boston, Los Angeles, London and Iceland, and we're all just working together on this project, and the fact that we're geographically apart is irrelevant. And so this technology is allowing us to work together, and it's allowing us to work very fast. It's very exciting to see it happening. Do you see, from the VR perspective, I, mean, I look at that and think, wow, that's a great way for some stories to unfold, mm. because you can really be a little more immersed in the environment. Yeah. Um, from the NVIDIA, HP side, mm. What are you seeing there as somebody looking at creating that they've done yeah. that's going to help you do something that hasn't ever been done before or tell your story in a way mm. that people haven't experienced before? You know, HP... That's going to have a payoff, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, HP are, are, are trendsetters, technically. You know, they're, they're developing new technology and uh, trying things out. And you have to just try stuff out in the workshop. You know, you've got things like Sprout, which is allowing you to cross the line into the virtual world, into the technology, uh, and be part of it in, in very intuitive ways. What I see happening, you know, the, the, the obvious next step is that not every, not every narrative works for 360 or VR. I think the narratives that do are the ones that would work as immersive theater. And then also you've got experiential stuff. So skiing down a mountainside or jumping out of an airplane, this stuff is amazing for 360 or for VR. But in terms of narrative, which is my passion, I think what we're going to begin to see is more and more technologies like Sprout allowing us to interact dynamically with these photorealistic objects. And we can see, you know, what we've always wanted is game characters that are 
film quality. You know, that's what we want. Turns out, in terms of experience, users don't really care. It doesn't matter. What matters is the movement. So we've got motion track, uh, motion tracking for actors with nuanced vocal performance. With uh, they have these amazing camera rigs that that film the cameras right here. Right. There's all these dots on the face, and you get very nuanced uh, uh, facial movement. There's a new technology. A couple of new technologies I've just seen. There's one called uh, Babylon I've just seen where. They, they measure the format of your voice, the timbre of your voice, exactly, and then they can have you speaking any language in your own voice, and they remodel your face to match the new language. So if you're producing multilingual content, it's pretty scary from a you know, rewriting yeah. history point of view, but it's actually your vocal sounds, all very natural and nuanced, in any language you want or saying anything you want. So we're now moving... We're on the cusp, I think, of... Well, you see, it, it's happening now in film already. You look at Gravity, almost the entire film, the only live-action content was their faces, and the rest was all computer-generated, and, and in some cases motion tracked. The Jungle Book. Look at The Jungle Book. I'm, I'm just in love with that film. Absolutely realistic-looking animals that are speaking. It's just, you know, it's like a childhood fantasy made real. The problem is that at the moment it takes quite a long time to render that photorealistically. Where I'm seeing things going with companies like HP and NVIDIA working on this stuff and Intel's NAND system, very fast storage, very many CPUs working very fast with lots of memory, we're seeing, and lots of um, pre-processed rendering, uh, you know, GPU acceleration. Where I'm seeing us going is that not that long from now, these animated, computer-generated visuals will be photorealistic from the start and very responsive, very fast. And you'll just say, well, let's see what happens if that tree starts walking around. Let's throw on that. We've already got it, pre-built natural walking uh, animations. Throw it onto the model. And now the tree is walking through the woods. And it allows us to just explore immediately. And again, I think that the first wave of virtual reality headsets will be relatively passive. You know, we've got some systems. There's a system that's been out for a while called Leap Motion that very precisely maps the movement of your fingers. Connect, actually, they never uh, fully released the full potential of it. It can go much more detail, much faster. It'll come in time. You'll be able to move in a very natural way. I think that we're already seeing now, and we're going to see more of this, you'll go to a shop and be scanned as a 3D model, and then although you're wearing a 3D headset, the headset will monitor your facial movements as well, and then if you and I are geographically displaced, it doesn't matter, I will still see you as you in that virtual model, and as you move your mouth and speak, I will see you moving your mouth and speak, and as you move your hands, I will see your hands. Of course, it could be you, or it could be you as Johnny Depp, or you yeah. as a dragon, and we'll be playing with that a lot. I think that's why Facebook were very wise to invest in Oculus, because they see this becoming a very social thing. But of course, that's the first wave. Let's say the first wave is perceiving things, the second wave is this avatar that we have in virtual space, but the third wave, perhaps, is real interaction. We're starting to look at the moment, there's a, a set of gloves you can get that introduce resistance to your fingers, and they have air pads in your fingertips, so when you pick up a virtual object, the fingers themselves prevent you from closing your hand, and you feel the pressure on your fingertips. We've had that for a few so, years. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got all sorts of haptic, haptic feedback device. devices. Yeah, but I'm seeing all of this happening without the gloves. Because if we can project basic information into the optic nerve, what's to stop us projecting into our nerves in your arm? So maybe you'll wear a, a, wrist, a couple of wristbands that project the sensation of resistance directly into your nervous system. And it's all virtual. So you can hand me a cup and I can take the cup from your hand. And we're already seeing people developing these technologies, again, with things like the, uh, the HoloLens technology, where people can hand each other virtual objects. But we need that haptic feedback because we're primates. We want to we feel it. Right. And, and I, I definitely think that's going to come. I was quite surprised that we did not see more uh, mobile devices using lenticular screens because lenticular stereoscopic images lend themselves really well to an individual user. And uh, Dolby had a technology, well, they have a technology that I think we're going to see used more and more that uses very high resolution screens to produce a wide viewing angle to give you good quality uh, stereo imagery without the special glasses. Nobody wants to wear the glasses. I, I think that what we're going to see in the future is 
what will appear to be true 3D objects and models, and we're going to have um, uh, characters that emerge through AI. So your kids, you know, you'll have all of these animals, and it'll be like The Sims. You'll right. say, okay, here's... Um, you'll say, uh, this character is, likes this sort of thing, this character has this history, and you'll construct scenarios, and, si and you'll hit go. And, and you'll watch what happens. And just watch what happens. Yeah. And I think we'll begin to see a new art form where people will construct the most interesting scenarios with unexpected characteristics. Many years ago, I was uh, very interested in, in what was traditionally called role-play games. Pencils and paper and dice. And I think it should be required at school. There was a whole thing in the 70s where they were saying, oh, it's devil worship. It's, you know, it's, oh, uh, people yeah. are going mad because they're playing these games. Not true at all. It's just improvisation. Yeah. And f fascinating because you have a character that you'll, you use, you play this character like a game for a very extended period of time. And you'll have groups of people will get together and they have an avatar effectively. And what's interesting about role play games is when you meet with the players that you've played with before, just like you go, you go, you know, you're in a bar, you know, and you're having a drink and you say, oh, you remember that time we were on that boat and you fell off? Oh, that was brilliant. You start having these conversations where you're saying, remember that time where you fought that dragon and you were in that, in that that's, cave? That's my measure of a great game. Absolutely. Is that people have yeah. a story to tell exactly. their friends and share with their friends about their experience with whatever game it may be. Right. It's happening in Minecraft. Ago. People are visiting right. each other's worlds in Minecraft and it, they're having these experiences directly. What is that going to be like when we're in a virtual world with a photorealistic environment, with full peripheral vision, with sound that's amazing quality, that's spatial as well, where we feel like we're touching things. I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to VR headsets. And I love first-person shooters. It's good for your reflexes. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to you know, a physical, tangible object that you hold, which is mapped in three-dimensional space by the game, where you're looking around. And what you want to be able to do is that. You want to be able to look around a corner in the virtual game, come back around the corner and do this with your hand. Yeah. And you are actually shooting other players and you're participating in the realm of the world, which you cannot do right now properly with, with the current technology. What happens when we're experiencing these stories together and we're uh, having these narratives emerging where AI is the game master and artificial intelligence is identifying our patterns of behavior and generating stories on the fly. And these are captured. Look at Twitch. One of the most popular online platforms today is just watching other, other players people. play. Yeah. And, and the, the inventors of that were very clever because they realized that it's actually quite nice watching another player play. Yeah. It's actually quite yeah. nice. So wait a minute, maybe other people would want to do that. So now we've got massive audiences watching some of the best gamers play games. And there's actually television shows now where the television show is a group of people sitting on a couch watching another show on television. <laughs> so you're watching talking, the people yeah. talking about what they're seeing. Life on reflecting, art reflecting. Yes, life. it's an interesting yeah. world. And we're well, going to be exploring these impossible narratives, first person, and having stories to tell about it yeah. that are exciting and dramatic. And uh, yesterday we were sharing anecdotes that were just perfect emergent storytelling. So at the moment, the narrative's laid out for you. But if you look at some of the best games, they create scenarios where you just happen to find yourself. They, they used to call it a, a sandpit game. You know, uh, Grand Theft Auto is a perfect example. In, in GTA, you have an artificially intelligent camera operator framing the shot dynamically because it looks nice. Yeah. And I think we're going to start to see AI spotting what you're doing and having characters interact with you in response to what you're doing, which is genuinely emergent. You have procedural design yeah. and you have this emergent design where no other player had that experience. It is genuinely just you. Yeah, and then imagine what happens when that all gets integrated with all the data from the Internet of Things. Yes. And it knows that you just got yes. a ticket today coming home in your car, driving right. too fast, yeah. and all this stuff goes. I know we, I'm being told by everybody. We're, we're out of time. We're way yeah. over again. I know. <laughs> Maxim. And this is, is the thing with AI training is to be better people. Oh, and yeah. AI it's companions, which are all coming. A whole world of yeah, things. it's very exciting. So we have to catch up again soon. But in the yes. meantime... Good luck on, on your fundraising Thank for the film. Thank you so films. much. Yeah, check and out jolliesgarden.com. Yeah, it's coming yeah. along. Yeah. So good to see yeah. you. Thanks. Thank you for having Appreciate me. Appreciate it. Thank you.